keynote lecturer, Mike Brown. Um, Mike is the uh, uh, Moncrief Distinguished Chair in Cholesterol and Atherosclerosis Research, uh, and also the Paul Thomas Chair. Multiple, there's almost a dinette set uh, there. Um, uh, being from Penn, we're particularly proud of the fact that uh, Mike received his BA degree in chemistry from University of Pennsylvania, his MD uh, in, uh, 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 from Penn as well, before going on to training at MGH and at the NIH with Earl Statman, where he very famously, uh, he had already, uh, of course, met his scientific partner, Joe Goldstein, uh, but they reunited and together have done seminal work in, uh, uh, particularly in the, world, in the world of lipids, from bench to bedside and back. I think that, that, that uh, cliche was invented for uh, Mike and Joe. Um, uh, everyone knows, uh, so I won't go through the long list of awards that he has won, but it includes the U.S. National Medal of Science and a Nobel Prize for Physiology, uh, Medicine or Physiology. So his title uh, tonight is All About SCAP, and uh, Mike, welcome. Thank you very much, Mitch, um, and th thank you very much for inviting me. I feel very privileged to have two times 25 minutes <laughs> to talk <laughs> with nothing afterwards. So um, it, it is a great uh, honor and a privilege for me, but I think you made a mistake, by the way. I think everyone should take out their, anyone who has the uh, program for this meeting, You'll notice that um, it's about metabolic signaling and disease, and it highlights nucleotide metabolism, which is very appropriate in this setting, for sure. Carbohydrate metabolism, really important. Amino acid metabolism, we all care about amino acids. Metabolism of cofactors and vitamins. Energy metabolism. <laughs> I'm going to talk about lipid metabolism. <laughs> Obviously, um, I'm, a, I'm definitely an afterthought. Okay, well, <laughs> anyway, um, thank you again. Thanks for inviting me. And um, let's see. The, the, um, I'm going to talk about a protein. Oh, yeah, I don't need that. I'm going to talk about a protein that is actually quite esoteric. Um, in the, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years since um, we discovered SCAP, I'm not aware of any paper uh, written about this protein, the protein itself, other than uh, that came from Joe in my laboratory. So clearly, this protein needs um, a little bit of pu public relations. So uh, tonight I'm going to give you some public relations about SCAP and why it's important in, in metabolism, not only in cholesterol metabolism, but also in fatty acid and triglyceride metabolism. <clears throat> and we've learned quite a bit about SCAP and how it performs its various functions. And during the course of the talk, I'll tell you about the domains of SCAP, um, uh, the domains of SCAP that um, you see highlighted on this slide, and we're going to go through each one uh, in some detail because we really have learned a lot about how this protein works. And the talk is divided into uh, two parts. First, in the first chapter, I'll tell you about the role of SCAP in cholesterol metabolism, and then um, I'll show you some of the data about how SCAP is important for fatty acid metabolism. So Joe Goldstein and I uh, were introduced to this field back in the early 1970s by our studies of the regulation of cholesterol metabolism in cultured fibroblasts. And what we found was that cells have LDL receptors that allow them to bind and take up this cholesterol-carrying lipoprotein to deliver it uh, uh, to take it up in coated vesicles, to deliver it to lysosomes where the cholesterol is liberated and used by the cell primarily uh, in, in tissue culture cells uh, for the function of the plasma membrane. Uh, and we also knew that 
the cells could also produce cholesterol from the two-carbon building block, acetyl-CoA, through a series of 30 different enzymatic steps um, uh, leading to cholesterol. And, and a key step is catalyzed by the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase, which is uh, uh, an early enzyme in the polymerization of uh, carbon atoms that eventually leads to cholesterol. Now, from our point of view, from our point of view, the most interesting part of this uh, scheme was the fact that both of these pathways are regulated. So when cholesterol levels are low in cells, if you deprive them of cholesterol, you see a big upregulation of the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway, primarily through the um, production of increased messenger RNAs for all of the 30 enzymes that you need to make cholesterol. And at the same time, there's an increased messenger RNA production for LDL receptors. So the cell will take up more LDL if it's available, and if not, it will make um, the cholesterol itself. But once cholesterol builds up in cells in a very sharp way, in, a, in an almost threshold response, there is a rapid reduction in all of these messenger RNAs, the messenger RNAs for the cholesterol biosynthetic enzymes and the mRNA for the LDL receptor. And this was the part of the one part of the process that um, intrigued us from the very beginning. But we really didn't um, understand it very well until um, the early 1990s when um, Mike Briggs and Zhao Dong Wang, postdoctoral fellows in the laboratory, isolated um, a transcription factor that is responsible for this regulation. We called it sterol regulatory element binding protein, or SREBP, which has the misfortune that it can't be pronounced as a single word, unlike RAS or MIC or MIB or uh, more like LXR. You, you really have to spell it out. Um, but um, SREBP is the key to that feedback regulation that I just discussed. And SREBP, when we identified it, and uh, cloned the cDNA, we realized that the amino terminal part of SREBP is a BHLH zip transcription factor, just like many other members of this family. It has certain differences uh, that cause it to specifically recognize sterile regulatory elements. But unlike all the other BHLH zip proteins that were known at that time, the peptide chain didn't stop at the end of this domain. Instead, the chain continued, and it encoded two transmembrane helices separated by a, a small luminal loop of 50 amino acids. And then it continued and then there, in, into a, a regulatory domain of about 400 amino acids. So this whole protein is about 1,200 amino acids long. And when it's made, the, because of these uh, transmembrane helices, the protein is synthesized on membrane-bound ribosomes and inserted uh, into the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum. And so the question immediately came, how in the world does this transcription factor, by the way, I, I believe that this was the f first um, membrane-bound transcription factor that had been identified. We now know of several others. Uh, but the question was, how, how in the world does this BHLH zip domain get from the endoplasmic reticulum uh, into the nucleus to turn on all of the genes to make cholesterol and also to make LDL receptors? And over the next 10 years or so, we were able to work out the details of how this process occurs. So here you see SREBP in the ER membrane. Immediately after it's synthesized, it binds to our hero, SCAP, that which is really the subject of this talk. And it binds to SCAP because SCAP has a carboxy terminal domain that contains WD repeats. And WD repeats are specialized to mediate protein-protein interactions. So as soon as SREBP is made, it binds to SCAP. In fact, if SCAP isn't there, then SREBP is rapidly degraded. It never uh, gets to the nucleus and never does anything. So it's the, the SREBP processing is absolutely dependent on SCAP. 
Now, what does SCAP do? Well, SCAP has a binding site for a cluster of proteins called COP2 proteins that had been defined by others through studies in yeast and animal cells. And the COP2 proteins cluster ER proteins, cluster them together into vesicles that bud off and uh, move to the Golgi complex. So when SCAP binds to the COP2 proteins, the COP2 proteins escort the SREBP SCAP complex into these vesicles, which then move to the Golgi complex in the cell. And there, the uh, SREBP encounters a serine protease, a membrane-bound serine protease, which we call site 1 protease. And the site 1 protease makes a clip within the luminal loop of SCAP, of SREBP. And what that does is it separates the SREBP into two halves. The BHLH domain, which is the transcription factor, remains bound to the, mem to the plasma membrane because it still has, I mean, to, to the ER membrane because it still has this um, one single transmembrane helix. And at this point, it's attacked by another protease, a metalloprotease, that was really quite unusual at the time that we isolated it. Now it turns out there are relatives of this as far back as Archaea. Um, but the site 2 protease uh, makes a clip within the plane of the membrane, and it releases the BHLH domain so that it can travel to the nucleus and turn on all of the genes that I described earlier. Now the question is why in the world does the cell go through this circuitous route to get a transcription factor into the nucleus? The reason is because the membrane localization of the SCAP SREBP complex allows the whole process to be regulated by cholesterol. So when cholesterol builds up in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, it binds to SCAP, as you will see, and that causes SCAP to bind to another protein called INSIG. I'm not going to say a lot about INSIG tonight, but it, it's a, a very important part of this uh, scheme. INSIG uh, is an anchor protein, and what, when SCAP binds to INSIG, it kicks out the COP2 proteins. So that, the, so that under these conditions, when cholesterol binds to SCAP, SCAP binds to INSIG, COP2 is no longer present, and therefore, this complex can't get into the vesicles to go to the Golgi, and as a result, there's no processing. And the SREBP that was in the nucleus is rapidly degraded, and as a result, when cholesterol builds up in the ER membrane, the SREBP uh, target genes all become downregulated. Now, as you can see from this uh, scheme, the SCAP protein is really important, and it has several really important functions. I mean, first, it has to bind SREBP. Secondly, it has to bind sterols. It has to be able to bind INSIG, and it has to be able to bind these COP2 proteins, all of them in a regulated way. And so over the last few years, we've tried to do a dissection, a biochemical dissection and a genetic dissection of SCAP to find out which parts of this protein um, play these individual roles. And what you can see here uh, in more detail is the amino acid sequence of SCAP. And these are the eight transmembrane helices um, of SCAP. And there are two very large uh, loops um, that face the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Loop one, uh, which has about 240 amino acids, and this loop seven, which has 160 amino acids. All the other loops are quite small, and, and uh, we don't think have much function other than to bridge the transmembrane helices. Now, um, the first um, domain I want to describe to you is loop six. Uh, 
Li Ping Sun, a, a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory, did extensive mutagenesis, alanine scanning mutagenesis of this very long 1,276 amino acid protein. And what he found was that the only residues that were important for binding to the, to the COP2 proteins was this sequence of six amino acids, which we pronounce mulatto. And these six amino acids serve as the binding site for the COP2 proteins. If you replace any of these amino acids, you lose uh, the ability of SCAP to bind to these COP proteins. And um, I'm not, uh, um, Li Ping's uh, uh, work is published, so I'll just summarize it here. This is the COP2 protein complex. It, the anchor is, is called SAR1. Uh, which functions in the GTP state. It's a, it's a GTPase. And there's the SEC23, SEC24 complex. And it's the SEC24 complex that recognizes this mulatal sequence. And what we found was that when uh, cholesterol bind, uh, builds up in the ER membranes, the mulatal sequence is still there, but it no longer uh, can bind to the SEC24 protein. And we think that the reason you lose this binding is because the mulatal protein must be at a very precise distance from the ER membrane in order to recognize this SEC24 protein. X-ray crystallography studies have been done by others of this um, COP2, and it's clear that, the sec that these proteins are a fixed distance from the ER membrane so that the mulatal sequence has to be right there. If we do even delete a single amino acid between the membrane and the mulatal, moving it down, uh, um, we lose the ability to bind COP2. Or if we add even a single amino acid, replacing the amino acids isn't a problem. But deletion or, or addition of amino acids, changing this position, uh, loses the binding. And so, and, and and we showed also that um, even though the COP2 proteins can't, can no longer bind the mulatal, a FAB fragment of an anti-mulatal antibody can still bind uh, the mulatal. So the, the mulatal sequence is there. It's just not in the right position to bind the COP2 proteins. All of this uh, was done by in vitro COP2 binding assays. Now the question is, um, can we show Remember, this is loop six of SCAP that has this mulatal sequence. At the same time that these binding studies were done, other fellows in the laboratory were using a trypsin cleavage assay to study conformational changes in SCAP that are induced by the binding of cholesterol. And what you can see here is, again, this is the structure of SCAP. The loop seven uh, is abbreviated here as 160 amino acids. But we have an, a monoclonal antibody against an epitope, a, a natural, not an added epitope, but a, a natural sequence within loop seven. We made an anti-peptide antibody that, that um, recognizes an epitope within loop seven. And we can use this antibody to visualize triptych fragments that are, that are generated by triptych digestion. So what we do is we prepare sealed membrane vesicles, ER membrane vesicles that are sealed and impermeable to trypsin. So trypsin can only work on the outside. And we digest the scap with trypsin, and then we um, um, run this thing out on an SDS page gel, and blot with an antibody against this epitope, which is protected from um, trypsin. And what we find is that if cells have been incubated in the absence of cholesterol, the trypsin cleaves here at amino acid 496 and here at this cluster of basic amino acids between 747 and 750. But if, the, if we've added cholesterol to these membranes, there's a new site that's exposed. A lysine or an arginine residue here at amino acid 505 is now exposed. And so we get a shorter fragment, a fragment that's shorter by nine amino acids. And we can visualize that by blotting on these SDS polyacrylamide gels. So this shows the 
the results of such an assay. We're taking sealed membrane vesicles. We're digesting them with trypsin. And here, and if the cell, if the um, membranes have been, the, the membranes are obtained from cholesterol depleted cells. And if we don't add cholesterol in vitro, we get this larger fragment. But if cholesterol is added within a minute, we see this smaller band indicating that this other arginine residue, arginine 505, has been exposed. So the cholesterol is inducing a conformational change that leads to the um, exposure uh, of, this, um, of this new arginine site in trypsin. So we believe then that um, the binding of cholesterol, wherever it happens to bind, um, leads to a conformational change in this loop six. That's where these arginines are. And that uh, somehow affects the accessibility of the mulatal sequence to the COP2 proteins. So uh, that's what loop six does. What about loop one? Well, we got a really big shock uh, when we found out that loop one is actually has the cholesterol binding site. Now, um, I should say um, that we've simplified things a little here because loop one is not totally soluble. We can prepare a cDNA encoding uh, just the, this uh, loop one inserted through the ER by a signal a cleavable signal sequence. And what we find is that loop one by itself is still membrane bound. And loop one has these three uh, hydrophobic stretches that we think anchor it to the ER membrane. So it's, it's not as simple as shown here. Uh, but the, the loop one is projects into the lumen. We know none of these sequences actually cross the membrane, but we think they dip into the membrane and allow loop one to somehow sample the cholesterol in the ER membrane. And um, so we can take this purified uh, loop one uh, and incubate it with tritiated cholesterol and through a, a nickel uh, affinity column, we can show that the tritiated cholesterol binds to loop one with saturation kinetics. And here's a control sterol progesterone, um, which um, does not bind. Now, we were also able to measure uh, the binding of cholesterol to the whole scap, the whole membrane part of scap, including all the transmembrane uh, region uh, one to eight. And when we did that, we found out and we tested a whole variety of sterols. And the ones in red are the ones that could compete with cholesterol for uh, binding. And the ones in black are ones that showed very little, if any, competition. And the three blue ones here uh, are intermediate. And what you can, so here's a typical example of um, the displacement of uh, competition for cholesterol binding and cholesterol uh, androstenol and desmosterol all compete. This is the most important control, epicholesterol, which differs only in the orientation of the three hydroxyl group, which in cholesterol, this is in the beta position, and in epicholesterol, this is in the alpha position. So the simple switch of that hydroxyl group uh, from, one, from one facing down to facing up um, absolutely destroys binding. So this is a highly specific uh, at least specific on, uh, for the hydroxyl orientation of the hydroxyl group. And what you can see here is when we classify these sterols, when we use the whole uh, transmembrane part of SCAP, the, these were the ones that competed and these didn't compete. And once we were able to purify the loop one, we found the exact same specificity. So it's very clear that loop one is the is the part of SCAP that, um, that binds uh, to cholesterol. So, all right, so we've got loop six being uh, COP2 binding, uh, loop one being cholesterol binding. What about NSIG? Well, this sequence of uh, these five 
um, transmembrane helices with these very small loops turns out to be the NSIG binding site. And how do we know that? We know that because we were able to isolate uh, using somatic cell genetics. We could mu mutagenize Chinese hamster ovary cells in culture and then select for uh, mutants that could not turn off their cholesterol synthesis. In these cells, SCAP functions normally. It carries SREBP to the Golgi, but when you add sterols, it doesn't turn off, it doesn't stop this process anymore. And um, it turns out that the reason is because these cells, these mutant SCAPs have lost the ability to bind uh, to NSIG. And we have three independently isolated mutants that do this, this tyrosine changed to a cysteine, and the other two, any one of these three will abolish the NSIG binding. And all of these substitutions were all um, in the, on the uh, cytosolic side of these uh, transmembrane helices. So we think that this face of, the, of that domain is very important for NSYNC binding. I'll show you a little of that data. Here we're using uh, blue native gel electrophoresis uh, to show uh, the complex between SCAP and NSYNC. So here uh, we're, we've taken uh, cells that, are either, that are, uh, have been transfected with SCAP and uh, incubated either in the absence of cholesterol or the presence of cholesterol and then run out on this native uh, page. And what you can see here is that, uh, and we're plotting for NSYNC. So in the, when the cells have not expressed, um, are not been exposed to cholesterol, the, all of the NSYG uh, uh, goes here as an unbound free NSYG. But when uh, the cells are expressing wild type scap and we uh, expose them to cholesterol, now the NSYG is bound to scap. And we can show this because this smear here also um, uh, blots with an antibody against uh, scap as well as NSYG. But when we transfect the cells instead of wild-type SCAP, we use one of these mutants, the Y298C mutant. Now, even in the presence of cholesterol, uh, there is no uh, scap NSYG complex. And, and we have similar data for the other two point mutants in SCAP. Uh, and this shows you how uh, the functional effect of that. Here, uh, we've made nuclear extracts of cultured cells and are blotting uh, on STS page, we're blotting for the nuclear SREBP2. You'll hear about the isoforms, but this is uh, a nuclear SREBP. This, so this protein has been taken to the Golgi and processed, and, and this is the SREBP in the nucleus. When we incubate the cells without sterols, here's the nuclear SREBP, and even low levels of sterols will abolish uh, this processing. But here's one of these point mutants in SCAP. And again, uh, there's marked resistance to uh, inhibition by sterols. So if you can't bind NSYG, um, then cholesterol has no way of stopping um, the um, SREBP processing. Now, the most recent uh, uh, findings published just uh, uh, two months ago um, we, uh, again, did extensive, basically complete alanine scanning mutagenesis, uh, not only of loop one, but also of now shown amplified loop seven. And what we found was that there were two residues here that we could mutate. These ha happened to be tyrosines, two residues that we could mutate that uh, put SCAP constitutively in the cholesterol bound com com conformation. So when we have expressed SCAP with either one of these mutants and then do the triptych assay, we always see the lower band saying that this and the SCAP is constitutively bound to NSIG even though uh, there's no cholesterol there. So either one of these two mutations, and we have a third one uh, in this uh, transmembrane helix that does the same thing. Now we have one more finding, and that is we can, ex we can cut SCAP in half. We can have a plasmid that expresses the first half of SCAP 
and then uh, stopping somewhere in this loop six, and then we can have another plasmid that expresses transmembrane seven and eight with this loop seven. When we co-express those in normal cells, what happens is, and we add an antibody to loop seven, we co-precipitate this, the amino terminal fragment. So if we do this with normal um, uh, scap, the two halves come together and, and, and are co-IP. But if we do it with either, any one of these three mutants, the co-IP fails. The, pr the proteins are expressed to normal levels, and you can uh, read the paper by uh, Zhang et al., but um, there's no longer co-IP. So what does that lead us to? What do we know? We know that if you have one of these mutations, you're, you're always in the cholesterol-bound conformation, and if you have one of these mutations, the two, loop one and loop seven, don't come together anymore. So our working model now for how this regulation occurs is that cholesterol, that, that normally, in order f uh, for this protein, to, if this mulatto to be in the right conformation, loop one and loop seven have to be together. And then when cholesterol binds to loop one, it separates loop one from loop seven. This changes the conformation since loop seven is connected directly to loop six, it changes the conformation in this region and prevents the mulatto from being recognized. So that's our working model, and um, we're doing everything possible uh, uh, that we can think of um, to test it. But we think we're getting close to understanding how this protein can sense cholesterol in the membrane and thereby uh, regulate um, cholesterol metabolism. and. And the whole point of it from the cell's perspective is to assure the proper cholesterol content in the cell. The cell doesn't want too much cholesterol because it can crystallize out of the membrane and kill the cell. It, it can't tolerate too little cholesterol uh, because it then dies. It has to have just the right amount and that's what SCAP is there to do. Now let me just show you how exquisite this system is. So um, here we have the ER membrane, and in the, when cholesterol is below 5% of the lipids in this membrane, the COP2 proteins are bound and SREBP is transported to the Golgi. When the cholesterol level in the ER membrane exceeds this really sharp threshold of 5%, there's no longer, SCAP then binds to NSIG and there's no longer any transport. And we were shocked, uh, Arun Radhakrishnan, um, when he was a postdoc in our lab, uh, did these studies. He purified ER membranes, measured the amount of cholesterol in the membranes, and correlated that with the ability of, um, uh, of SCAP to transport SREBP uh, based on the uh, amount of activity of SREBP in the nucleus. So let me just show you some of the data. Here we've taken cells in the absence of cholesterol and um, the um, ER cholesterol level at this point is quite low, below 2%, and uh, the, there's active processing and nuclear SREVP is very high. If you just raise the cholesterol content above this 5% threshold, there's this very sharp um, inhibition of uh, SREBP processing and nuclear SREBP gets very low. Here we've added cholesterol to the cell in a carrier, cyclodextrin, which can uh, add, uh, carry cholesterol to the membrane. Uh, we can also add cholesterol as a lipoprotein, and in these CHO cells we use um, a, a rabbit lipoprotein called beta VLDL that binds to LDL receptors and delivers cholesterol through the lysosome. And again, you see the same threshold here. Uh, and we've done it by removing cholesterol from the cell or by adding beta VLDL. That's what some of these symbols are. We always get this very sharp, sharp threshold. So it's interesting that um, this, this threshold is at 5% of, e, of the lipid in the ER membrane. That's a very low percentage. 
cholesterol in the plasma membrane, cholesterol is about 40% of the, of the lipids in the plasma membrane. So nature has put this sensing system in the ER membrane so that it can be very sensitive to very low levels of cholesterol in the ER membrane. And uh, one of the big thrusts of our laboratory now is to try to decide, nobody really knows how this partitioning of cholesterol occurs. Why is it that the plasma membrane can have 40% of its lipid as cholesterol and the ER membrane uh, doesn't want to go above 5% because once it goes above 5%, it turns off the SREBP processing. And so um, to understand that, we have to understand how cholesterol equilibrates between membranes of cells. It's been a very obtuse and difficult problem to solve, but um, we're working very hard on that. I just want to show you one other feature of this, and that is that the position of this threshold um, car can be affected by the amount of NSAID. So remember, what happens when cholesterol is binding to SCAP, it's causing SCAP to bind to NSAID. Well, if you have a lot of NSAID, you can shift this curve. If we overexpress NSAID in cells, what it does is it makes the cells more sensitive to cholesterol in the ER membrane. So that also says that the amount of NSAID has to be very carefully controlled in cells um, in order to allow, to, to set this threshold uh, for um, suppression of SREBP cleavage. Okay, now in, in the remaining uh, time, I want to talk about um, the other function of uh, SCAP, which is uh, to allow the processing of SREBP in the liver where it controls fatty acid synthesis. And to understand that, you have to understand <coughs> that there are three isoforms of SREBP. Um, they're, they're produced by two genes, SREBP1 and SREBP2. SREBP1 gives rise to two transcripts, 1A and 1C, from two alternate promoters. <coughs> And these two alternate promoters cause uh, different uh, first um, exons. And so the 1A uh, transcript has a long acidic domain, which helps to recruit coactivators. And so 1A is uh, the most, uh, a very potent form of SREBP. 1C has a shorter uh, acidic domain. It's actually less potent. But as I'll show you, it has specific functions in fatty acid metabolism. <coughs> SREBP2 has only one transcript uh, with an acidic domain. Now it turns out that these two, pro, uh, two genes have different functions in the liver. And it turns out that this is a list of it's, it's some of the genes regulated by SREBP, uh, not all of them. And um, what we know is that SRE, in the liver, SREBP2 controls all of the genes necessary to make cholesterol. A lot of this work was done by uh, Tim Osborne, who's um, in the audience. Um, and so um, S these all these genes have SRE uh, recognition sites in their enhancer regions, uh, and they're all under the control primarily of SREBP2. On the other hand, the other transcript in the liver is SREBP1C. It turns out that the liver makes very, very little of SREBP1A. SREBP1A is primarily uh, produced by growing cells to produce new membranes. But SREBP1C is the predominant transcript in the liver. This is the one with the shorter transcription activating domain. SREBP1C is a much, much weaker activator of the cholesterol synthetic genes. But it's a very strong activator of all the genes that are necessary to make uh, long chain fatty acids as well as co to convert them into triacylglycerides and phospholipids. And um, so it's, it's a very potent activator of the first committed enzyme, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, 
and then fatty acid synthase, which polymerizes uh, the malonyl CoA to form um, uh, uh, stearic acid, uh, palmitic acid, and um, stearic acid, and then. This is a very important enzyme, stearyl-CoA desaturase, which introduces a double bond and makes monounsaturated fatty acid. This is another very important enzyme, glycerol-3-phosphate acyltransferase, that um, initiates the process of triacylglyceride synthesis. Turns out that the liver has um, two different isoforms of uh, glycerol-phosphate acyltransferase, um, and um, only one of them uh, GPAT1 is controlled by SREBP1C. That turns out to actually be very important, as shown recently by Rosalind Coleman. So, um, the, the SREBP1C activates fatty acids and synthesis and makes triglycerides. Nature is really smart. I mean, I have to, I admire her enormously because she also knew that. Um, in order to make both cholesterol and fatty acids, you need lots and lots of NADPH. And there are three enzymes that produce the bulk of NADPH, and all three of these enzymes are induced by the SREBPs, and so uh, are the, these enzymes, ATP citrate lyase, that you need to make acetyl-CoA. So the whole toolkit for making cholesterol or triglycerides all of them are regulated um, by SREBPs. Now, SREBPs turn out to be, SREBP1C turns out to be a very important factor in the normal response to insulin in the liver. And so, as shown in this diagram, dietary glucose comes in, it's sensed by the pancreas, the pancreas makes insulin, insulin goes to the liver, and it has one very well-known, very highly characterized reaction. And that is, it turns off gluconeogenesis, a key enzyme being uh, phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase, PEPC, PEPC-K, which is uh, reduced when insulin uh, acts on the liver. So the first action of insulin, here's glucose coming in, insulin turns off glucose production in the liver, um, and one of the mediating agents is uh, this transcription factor called FOXO1. But insulin has another effect on the liver, and that is to, as I'll show you, it is a potent inducer of SREBP1C, both at the level of messenger RNA, and it also increases the processing of SREBP1C. As a result, when insulin acts on the liver, there's an increase in the synthesis of fatty acids. So some of the glucose that's coming in, the liver's no longer making glucose, but the, some of the glucose that's coming in is being converted to fatty acids. The fatty acids are incorporated into triglycerides, which then um, go to um, adipose tissue for storage, or they can go to muscle uh, for combustion for energy. Meanwhile, the glucose that's being metabolized, much of it is taken up by muscle uh, and also by fat, and that is also under the regulation of insulin, which increases GLUT4 and increases lipoprotein lipase to allow um, triglycerides to deliver their fatty acids to fat. So it's, it all makes sense. You have glucose coming in you, in excess of the metabolic needs of the body. Some of it's converted to fatty acids through the action of SREBP1C and stored in adipose tissue. Now let me just show you some of the evidence for the action of insulin on SREBP1C. It turns out that um, none of the so-called hepatocyte cell lines that we've ever studied, and I think we've studied just about every one of them, uh, behaves like the liver. Uh, in terms of response to insulin. And so we've had to, uh, we have to use fresh hepatocytes. And rat hepatocytes are more sensitive to insulin in vitro, even though in vivo, mouse and rat livers are very sensitive to insulin infusions. But when you isolate the hepatocytes, 
mouse, mouse hepatocytes lose their sensitivity to insulin very quickly. Rat hepatocytes maintain it for at least 24 hours. And so what we do for these studies is kill a rat and isolate the hepatocytes and then try to study them within 24 hours. And what you can see here, this we're measuring the relative mRNA levels for SREBP1C and the other transcript from the same gene, BP1A. Um, and in the absence of insulin, they're both low. When insulin is present, the 1A stays low, but 1C is markedly, the messenger RNA for SREBP1C is markedly increased. And here's a concentration curve, and it, this happens at very relevant concentrations of insulin, relevant uh, because the, the liver is the target organ for insulin. Insulin, when it's secreted from the pancreas, is secreted into the portal vein and carried directly to the liver where, it, where it's in its highest concentration. So uh, there's a selective increase in SREBP1C uh, when insulin is added to rat hepatocytes. What about in vivo? Well, here we have um, uh, rats in which we've destroyed the pancreas, the, we destroyed the beta cells of the pancreas by treating them with this toxin, streptozotocin. And here's the amount of messenger RNA for SREBP1C in control animals. The, uh, these are in the fed state. The animal that has been treated with streptozotocin has um, a marked reduction because there's no insulin. You now infuse insulin into that animal, and within a few minutes, the SREBP1C messenger RNA reappears. At the same time that the 1C mRNA reappears, you begin to see the, so here's the amount of fatty acid synthase messenger RNA eliminated by streptocytosin when insulin goes down, restored by infusing insulin. Here's acetyl-CoA carboxylase, the other important enzyme in fatty acid synthesis, and again, uh, regulated in the same way. Now here's an enzyme of gluconeogenesis, PEPCK. It behaves exactly the opposite. So here in the fed state, the, uh, the messenger RNA for, uh, for PEPCK is very low because in the fed state, the liver doesn't want to make any glucose. Uh, but when you treat with, but this is due to the suppression by insulin because when you simply get rid of insulin, by streptocytosin, now you see this massive amount of PEPCK, and again, it's turned off by insulin. Here are two, notice that SREBP2 is not regulated in the same way, and um, this is another control, apple E. So, um, how can we tell, so far I've shown you a correlation, uh, SREBP1C goes up with insulin, and so do all the messenger RNAs for the fatty acid synthesizing enzymes. Uh, how can we tell that, um, that, that this is due to SREBP? Uh, well, it, uh, it was a little complicated because when we knock out SREBP1C, what we find is that there's some kind of compensation and SREBP2 mRNA goes up and SREBP2 can also, when it's expressed at high levels, can also regulate these fat, fatty acid synthesizing genes. So we, but we, knew, we have a way of knocking out all the nuclear SREBPs, and that is to simply knock out SCAP. Don't forget the first half of this talk. You can't, you're not, you can't have forgotten it already. Um, so we made liver-specific SCAP knockout mice. These mice um, have lock sites inserted into their SCAP gene, and we have Cre encoded by an albumin promoter so that the Cree recombinase is only expressed in the liver, and so these animals um, lack scap in their liver from their time of birth. I should say that uh, the animals, the wild-type animals that are missing scap, look perfectly normal, they grow perfectly normal, uh, and obviously uh, uh, seem um, quite normal until you start studying their fat metabolism. So here you see the... Um, response to fasting and refeeding in livers of scap knockout mice. So let me just pick, well, we've been talking about acetyl-CoA carboxylase, the enzyme of, of uh, fatty, first permitted enzyme of fatty acid synthesis. In a normal mouse that's fasting, uh, 
the level of messenger RNA is very low. And as I've, sh uh, when you refeed the animal uh, and insulin is now secreted, you get this massive increase in the messenger RNA for acetyl-CoA carboxylase. But if the animal has no scap, the, there's no response to the insulin induction by refeeding. The same thing is true with fatty acid synthase. Uh, this is malic enzyme that produces uh, the NADPH. Here's stearyl-CoA desaturase. And here's the other enzyme, uh, GPAT, which is also uh, fails to be uh, induced um, by refeeding when you um, don't have scap. So it's not just a correlation. If you can't put SREBP into the nucleus, you don't induce these messenger RNAs by refeeding, and refeeding is acting primarily by raising insulin and, and also, I should say, by lowering glucagon. So what about uh, diabetes? You know, a classic complication of type 2 diabetes is fatty liver. The liver of a type 2 diabetic human or, or rodent overproduces fatty acids, overproduces triglycerides, and you end up with this massive fatty liver. Um, and here's the model that we've studied, the, the quite well-known OBOB mouse. This is a wild-type mouse. This is an OBOB mouse that uh, was worked out by uh, Coleman and, and uh, Jeff Friedman. And this mouse is missing leptin, and so it eats and eats and eats and becomes massively obese. The sequela of obesity is insulin resistance, and as a result of that, here's a normal fasting insulin level in a, in a normal mouse, and in this obese mouse, it's 50-fold higher. This is massive insulin resistance. I mean, if, if we tried to raise the insulin level of a normal mouse to this level by giving insulin, the mouse would die immediately of hypoglycemia. This mouse is this obese mouse is so resistant to insulin that um, it requires this level to even partially control its, uh, its blood sugar. Um, and so again, here you see what I showed you earlier, the normal liver response to insulin by uh, decreasing gluconeogenesis, increasing SREBP1C. Um, and what happens in the diabetic liver, and this is this was the shock that we had um, when we began to study these animals. In the OBOB in the mouse, uh, of course, they're eating uh, much more food than normal, so they're getting this tremendous stimulus to um, insulin production. As is long been known, when, when the liver uh, in this state becomes insulin resistant, and as a result of that, you, it no longer turns off gluconeogenesis. Now, this is a little misleading. It's not that there's a massive increase in gluconeogenesis, but what there is is a failure to turn off gluconeogenesis. So in, these, in the liver of these mice, even though the insulin level is 50-fold above normal, the, uh, the, the gluconeogenic enzymes are not turned off. They're acting just as though the mouse was starved, even though the mouse is actually overeating and they're, you're getting starvation levels of gluconeogenesis going on under these conditions. So the liver here is markedly insulin resistant. But the shocking thing is, as I'll show you in a minute, despite this insulin resistance, the, the uh, OBOB animal has marked increase in SREBP1C, marked increase in fatty acids, and marked increase in triglycerides, all of which are driven by insulin. So insulin, here are two pathways in the same liver, uh, gluconeogenesis, which is resistant to the action of insulin, and SREBP1C, which is still sensitive. And so what you get is the worst of all possible worlds. You have a situation where the liver continues to produce glucose, and then it converts large amounts of that glucose, as well as the, the dietary glucose, into fatty acids through the action of SREBP1C. So this is a, this is a a prescription for, um, for fatty acid overproduction. No wonder that these mice get, as I'll show you, massive uh, fatty livers. And they also have increased, uh, actually these OBOB animals don't have too much of an increase in triglycerides in their plasma. They 
mostly retain it in the liver. Um, and, um, and so the combination of continued production of glucose as well as the uh, glucose coming in, as well as the insulin resistance that is occurring in fat and muscle leads to the characteristic abnormalities of diabetes. Hyperglycemia and hypertriglyceridemia. So um, here, this is, shows, here's an, a wild type mouse uh, that's been opened up here. Here's a litter mate that's an OBOB mouse. And what you see, here's a normal liver, uh, nice and dark in color. And here's this huge liver. It's pale here because it's engorged with triglycerides. Um, despite this massive accumulation of lipid in the liver, the, the amount of SREBP1 protein is markedly um, increased um, in the nucleus of these uh, mice. Um, a totally inappropriate uh, situation considering the marked uh, fat accumulation that's already there. And this can be uh, demonstrated directly by uh, injecting tritiated water into the animal, into the living animal, and looking at fatty acid synthesis. And um, here's the rate of fatty acid synthesis in a wild type animal, and here it is in an OBOB animal. And this increased synthesis is occurring even though the triglycerides in, I mean, when we, people refer loosely to massive fatty liver, this is massive fatty liver, okay? This is, you know, 180 um, uh, milligrams per gram of liver, 18, you know, percent of the liver is fat. Um, so, uh, totally inappropriate. Now, how do we know that that is due to SREBP1C? Well, again, we can use our scap, our liver scap knockout mice. So we've taken OBOB animals uh, and mated them with the liver scap knockout uh, mice. So these animals are, are OBOB, but they can't. Uh, put SREBP into the nucleus in the liver. And so what do you see here? Here's, again, these are some of the lipogenic uh, messenger RNAs that are under control of SREBP1C. And here you see in the, the wild type animal, this is the level of messenger RNA for acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Massively increased in, or at least fourfold increased in the OBOB. And then, but if the OBOB animal doesn't have SREBP in the nucleus, this increase does not occur. Same thing is true with fatty acid synthase, this elongase that converts palmitic to stearic acid, and here's steroid-CoA desaturase. So um, if, you can't, if the mouse can't get SREBP into the nucleus, this, um, th this uh, increase in these messenger RNAs does not occur. And um, as a result of that, if you look at uh, fatty acid synthesis, again, here's our incorporation in, of tritiated water in the wild type. Here it's increased in the OBOB, and now we take away scab, and the fatty acid synthesis is actually below normal. Uh, here, uh, again, OBOB, um, the triglycerides in the liver massively elevated and return to normal. Here are some pictures. This is, again, the wild type liver. This is the huge uh, fatty liver of the OBOB. When there's no scap there, uh, there is, um, there's no fatty liver. Now, the surprising thing from this, first of all, you have to understand that even without scap in the liver and without fatty acid synthesis in the liver, these animals are just as obese as their litter mates that have scab. And not only that, they're just as diabetic. So here you have um, a glucose tolerance test. This is an oral glucose tolerance test in a wild type mouse. You give glucose, it goes up and then comes down with insulin. Uh, when insulin is secreted, uh, if the wild type mouse lacks scap in the liver, there's no effect on normal glucose tolerance. Here's the very abnormal glucose tolerance in the OBOB animal. And um, uh, 
it's exactly the same. There's no, there's no difference when, when SCAP is not there. And uh, the same thing, you can show the same thing by infusing insulin and, here, and measuring the, the uh, blood glucose. So here's the elevated blood sugar in the wild type in the OBOB animal. It's just as elevated in the one without SCAP. And in a normal mouse, you get this rapid decrease in glucose, and it, it's markedly blunted when you infuse insulin in the <coughs> SCAP knockout. So, so what we, the way we envision this is that um, when you can't, when you don't have SREBP1C in the nucleus, uh, I mean, uh, when you knock out SCAP, insulin can no longer increase SREBP1C, and therefore you no longer have this fatty acid overproduction, no longer have uh, uh, these big fatty livers, but the animal still has the problem of, of handling its glucose, blocking, knocking out fatty acid synthesis in the liver has done nothing to, um, to affect um, the impaired uh, glucose clearance, and as a result, the animal remains diabetic. Now, we're still working uh, to find out where the fatty acids are being made in this um, animal when, you can, when they can't make fatty acids in the liver, and, and we have a very good preliminary evidence, preliminary evidence that, uh, that the increased fatty acid synthesis is occurring in the fat, in the white adipose tissue. When you can't make fatty acids in the liver through scap knockout, the, the, um, the, the adipose tissue seems to take over, and um, we're um, trying to work out that mechanism. So let me conclude then by um, referring to at least three challenging questions. Uh, first, to take us back to the first half of the talk, how does cholesterol binding to loop one uh, change the conformation of loop seven of SCAP? Uh, and we think it's due to a direct interaction between loop one and loop seven uh, that is, um, and, and um, abolished by when cholesterol binds to loop one, and, and we're testing that now with actually with uh, soluble forms of loop one and loop seven, eliminating this whole membrane domain, and then seeing if we can regulate this interaction in vitro. Uh, this is a <laughs> these these two words are misprints or not misprints; they're mistakes. Uh, <laughs> How does, what, I, what we wanted to say is how does insulin increase both the amount of SREBP1C and its activity? We know that the induction of SREBP1C messenger RNA by insulin also requires the nuclear hormone LXR that has to be in an active state in order for the insulin to work. And uh, we're actively trying to study how um, insulin regulates LXR. Um, so, and we also don't understand how insulin increases the processing. I haven't really shown you any data, but we have abundant data showing that insulin not only increases the messenger RNA for SREBP1C, but it also increases the processing of SREBP1C and its entry into the nucleus, and we're trying to figure out how that happens. This word should also be SREBP1C. How can the diabetic liver be simultaneously sensitive to insulin, increased SREBP1C, and resistant failure to suppress gluconeogenesis? Um, that is a conundrum, and you know, we hope that somebody like Mari Birnbaum will figure that out for us. I, we, we, we're the only people that have for for have studied regulation for 40 years and have never had to deal with phosphorylation. <laughs> <laughs> and we're also, the only, we're also the only people that have studied a transcription factor for 20 years and have never st actually studied DNA. <laughs> so you haven't seen DNA and you haven't seen phosphorylation. But I'm afraid if we're going to understand how insulin uh, affects these processes, we're going to have to jump into the quagmire of uh, kinases. Um, 
So with that, I thank you. I thank the, the organizers again for inviting me. Um, and uh, I look forward to the rest of the meeting. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. I forgot, I forgot my co-conspirators here. Some of you may know some of these people. They're really, we've really been helped by not only students and postdocs, but also some fa faculty collaborators, especially Jay Horton uh, and Go Sheng Liang and Bob Hammer in uh, Dallas. Again, thank you. Questions? Yeah, so you showed that SCAP is necessary for the increased SRUVP induced gene expression right. in the liver. Right. Um, do you think that there is a cholesterol independent mechanism whereby insulin is regulating SCAP? Or do you think it's actually going somehow through? Well, uh, again, you put your finger on uh, uh, something that we don't fully understand. Um, it turns out that if we take hepatocytes, uh, from a rat, as I showed you, and we had, um, well, I didn't show you actually, <laughs> I didn't show you any of the processing data, but if we, if we actually have gone to the trouble of making a transgenic rat that expresses SREVP1C from a constitutive promoter so that the messenger RNA isn't regulated by insulin. So you take hepatocytes from that rat and you add insulin, what you see is a pure increase in the processing of SREVP1C. And the sort of shocking thing is that if we add excess cholesterol to, the, to the, that, those hepatocytes in vitro, um, the SRUP1C processing is turned off. So it's still sensitive um, to, um, to, to cholesterol. And yet, that's only when you add cholesterol exogenously to the, you know, cholesterol feeding doesn't turn off uh, uh, fatty acid synthesis. So, we don't understand it. Something overrides cholesterol in the liver, and, and uh, we're not sure. Tim Osborne may have the answer. I have a question. <laughs> um, Mike? Um, the mulatto sequence in SCAP interacts with SEC24. Um, SEC24 is involved in a lot of other right. proteins going to the Golgi apparatus. Right. Is there mulatto in any other proteins? No. In fact, none of the other proteins, many proteins, um, uh, interact with SEC24, um, there, nobody's been able to write a consensus sequence for any of them. Um, so uh, the, the details of that recognition are not at all clear. Um, it's interesting, there are four isoforms of, of SEC24, A, B, C, and D. And I don't know, we, Peter Espenshade, who did these experiments as a postdoc in our lab, happened to pick SEC24C. It turns out that's the only one of the three isoforms that binds um, SREVP, uh, that binds SCAP. So um, anyway, uh, we don't know the answer to that question. So uh, a Japanese group recently identified fatostatin as an inhibitor binding to SCAP. Based on your data now, can you give us some insights how it might work? We've worked with fatostatin. It, it actually blocks almost all ER to Golgi transport. I mean, we, you, the classic model for uh, ER to Golgi transport is VSPG protein, which is made in the ER and then gets carbohydrate modified in the Golgi. And um, fatostatin at the same concentrations that block SREVP um, block uh, that. So we don't think that there's a specific uh, regulation of SCAP. It's, it, it blocks ER to Golgi transport. Hello. I really enjoyed your talk and was very fascinated to know that ER had only 5% cholesterol. Right. And so what happens to your scap knockouts in terms of ER cholesterol levels or how does the ER membrane look without the sensing gone now? Well, the, remember we're only knocking out scap in the liver. The, the, there's a lot of cholesterol in the animal. Um, we haven't seen any sign that the liver is depleted of cholesterol or, or any other. Uh, uh, in fact, the, the cholesterol biosynthetic enzymes, the messenger RNAs for cholesterol biosynthetic enzymes, are, oh, 
and the other thing is that uh, well, the, H the cholesterol biosynthetic enzymes, the messenger RNAs, are down, and yet there doesn't seem to be cholesterol deficiency. There's a safety valve in the system because once cholesterol goes over 5%, there's another enzyme called ACAT, which esterifies the cholesterol, it attaches a long chain fatty acid so it can be stored as lipid droplets. So, um, and the whole thing has to be coordinated. It would be a, a bad thing if, if cholesterol went to the ER and it got esterified before it bound to scab and turned off SREP processing. So the, the system has to be regulated so that SREP processing gets turned off first when cholesterol builds up in the ER. And then only the excess cholesterol gets esterified. So you, so you should have very beautiful it. It's here. So beautiful is our SIBP complex sensing right. cholesterol. Right. Does the SIBP complex also able to sense fatty acid or triacylglycerol? There is, we, 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 we do have data saying that unsaturated fatty acids can uh, block the processing of SREBP1 in cultured fibroblasts. We haven't studied that in the liver. So um, I have to say, uh, but we, we, there's no question that in, in certain cell lines in tissue culture, if you deprive them of all fatty acids as well as uh, cho cholesterol, and then you add back cholesterol without adding back fatty acids, you won't turn off SREP1 processing. So something is going on with fatty acids, um, but we don't know in detail. Uh, very interesting data uh, on a membrane-bound transcription factor. I would like to know, besides cholesterol, does the transcription factor respond to cyclic AMP or calcium? Uh, well, as I said, we, we've not been uh, excited about kinases. Um, <laughs> I, I, there, there are papers saying that SREP1A can be phosphorylated um, by cyclic AMP-dependent kinase, and it may have something to do with regulation of that activity. Um, we have not studied that. So uh, my question comes from the fact that uh, there are proteins, there are around 50 proteins which are known as A-kinase anchoring proteins. They are present all over the cell, which uh, like sense localized cyclic AMP concentration. So I was interested in knowing whether uh, your SCAP molecule binds to any of the A-caps and that uh, is the fine tuning mechanism which it can involve for signaling. Well, we have, not, we have studied things like forskolin and you know, in the uh, old days yeah. and, and cholera toxin. And, None, none of the activators of adenylate cyclase affect the processing of SREP. But there may be some evidence that it affects the activity once the, S, you know, the, the activity of the nuclear form of SREP. We haven't studied that. Thank you. Um, Mike, I was fascinated by the, uh, the sterol sensing domain being localized to the lumen of the, of the ER. And uh, I guess on the one hand, maybe that makes sense with endocytosis as it's the, the analogous membrane, but um, I'm wondering if you can comment on the cholesterol distribution in the cytosolic phase versus the lumen, and also, you know, does the esterification reaction then happen on the cytosolic phase, and it has to be flipped in order to That's a good question. I, we certainly know, we, and I don't think anyone has any idea about the uh, asymmetrical distribution of cholesterol in the, and we don't really know how the loop one uh, dips into that membrane, so we really don't know where the co how how it's um, accessing. I mean, it just it's clear that the that that it's it's measuring the cholesterol content of the membrane. Not there is no soluble cholesterol or no, or no uh, protein bound cholesterol floating around. It, it, it's sensing the, the so it has to be dipping into that membrane, and uh, you know we never get a structure. Have some clue to that. I was wondering about another SREP2 regulated factor, PCSK9, yeah. which now also seems to be moving using the COP2 complex. Right. How can you make this into some kind of coordinate? Uh, I don't think so. I think all of the things that we've seen that regulate SREP processing are very specific for SREP. So the COP2 proteins, even though if SCAP doesn't bind the COP2 proteins, PCSK9 and all the other guys can. So um, 
we, we haven't done anything that affects globally the activity of COP2 protein. Uh, so PCSK9 presumably gets on its merry way. I mean, the fascinating thing about PCSK9 is why is it there? Exactly. <laughs> and maybe Jonathan Cohen can tell us his latest theory. But uh, the, the fact is, uh, you know, why do we have this protein that's destroying LDL receptors all the time? And why is it under control of this same uh, transcription factor? So at the very time you're trying to turn on LDL receptors with SREBT, in case some of you don't know, by the time you get to be my age, some of you may be taking antibi antibodies against PCSK9. But the fact is that PCSK9 is a protein that's made in the liver, that's secreted into plasma, comes back to the liver, and binds to LDL receptors, and goes into the cell with LDL receptors, and traps the LDL receptors into the, in the cell so they can't recycle and they get degraded. And P PCSK9 is a major regulator of LDL levels in the blood because there are people with mutations in PCSK9, and if you're homozygous for a loss of function mutation in PCSK9, your LDL cholesterol level is somewhere around 20. So take PCSK9 out of the equation, and our LDL receptors are much, much more active. The shocking thing is that PCSK9 is an SREBP target. It's, and so um, when at the same time, when the liver wants more cholesterol, and it is making it, the only thing that I can, well, I, I don't even want to speculate. We've done a lot of speculating around us. Why I <laughs> so, uh, so second part, you are, one, you are talking about fatty liver and insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. There is a tight correlation in human patient. But when you, knock, uh, when you generate double, knock, double biogenic mice, right. you have less fatty liver, right. but still there is a insulin resistance in the peripheral right. tissue. Yeah. Do you have any insight? Insulin resistance, not only in the peripheral tissue, but also still in the liver. Uh, no, I mean, there have been all kinds of, you know, trying to tie in diacylglycerol levels in the liver and insulin resistance, and all I can tell you is what our findings are, that you can um, at least normalize the triglyceride. Now remember, this is one model. Um, it's a very severe model. Right. So I, won, I, I was wondering, have you tried diet-induced obese mice in the scab knockout? Animal? Not in the, no. Uh, um, we're, we're doing that now. Um, we have um, studied um, uh, hamsters that are fed a high sucrose diet. They get fatty livers as well. And um, in the hamsters, uh, in collaboration uh, with the company Al Nylon, we were able to give um, an siRNA against scap, and that abolished the fatty liver, at least in a sucrose-fed hamster. Um, the question of, uh, you know, a lot of people have thought that, that the overproduction of fatty acids is a major contributor to um, to the uh, insulin resistance in muscle, uh, and at least from this one model, it doesn't look like that's the case. I don't know what Dr. Birnbaum thinks. Okay, well, great questions, and thanks again to Michael.